Statistics is a very broad subject, it covers many things that we want to know about the world around us. And unfortunately, in class, we don't always have enough time to really give you the opportunity to write down everything that needs to be written down, to really pick apart terms and definitions. So the idea of flipping the classroom is really to give you the chance to pause a lesson if necessary, write down what you need to write down, replay something if you didn't quite catch it if I was talking too fast, or if you just need a refresher, come back and watch it again. So as we go through this, please take the time, if you need to, to press pause, rewind, see what you missed. This is all about making sure you have the opportunity to get the most from the lesson that you can. Now, when we come back into class, I will highlight some of the key aspects of this, but I will not go in depth as much as I will here. I will do my best to keep this short and sweet, however, so that you don't have to listen to me for hours and hours on end outside of class. Now, we've covered a couple of things in our class so far. In unit one, we talked about laying the groundwork for statistics. What is this idea of data? What does data represent? What kind of ideas can we get from data? How can we display data? And what types of trends do we see in data? Now we're looking at unit three, which is all about how do we get that data in the first place? How does that come to us? Does that come to us in the form of a survey, observational study, an experiment? And is it even something that we can use to make decisions or to make predictions in real life? One of the foundations to how data comes to us is this idea of randomness. And that's what chapter 10 is all about. It's all about understanding randomness. Now, random oftentimes gets assigned this idea of being fair. And something is random, something is fair, means that you cannot guess the outcome before it happens. You know that a teacher's selecting students randomly from a class if you can't predict who that teacher is going to select. If you always know who they're going to go to, that is not random selection. Now, sometimes not every single thing has equal opportunity. Sometimes when things are fair, we happen to know that there's an existing underlying set of rules. For example, if you're pulling cards from a deck of cards, you should have a fair deck, which means every card has an opportunity to be selected. You shouldn't know what's coming next. But if you're talking about the likelihood of getting a face card, that likelihood is going to be a lot smaller than the likelihood of getting a card with a number on it. So even though those probabilities are not going to be the same, it can still be a fair scenario if you do not know what's coming next and if the rules are set. So just an example of some things that are random, and it's an important thing for us to understand. Even the ability to be random is a very difficult thing to do, but it provides us as an extremely useful tool. Okay, We've already mentioned the idea of fairness. Random numbers and having a way to be a perfectly random allows you to avoid bias. And that's going to be one of our big words this year is bias, something that's going to steer your results one way or another. Now, the thing here is trying to be really random is actually something that takes a lot of work and it's very, very hard to do. Now, it's not easy being random. Even if you try very, very hard to sit there and come up with a list of random numbers yourself, you are going to be predisposed to picking certain numbers in a certain order. You're going to notice patterns with the numbers that you've already listed, and you will try to avoid that pattern in the future. That's not being random. It is actually very, very difficult to generate random numbers ourselves even if every single number is equally likely. So we have to have ways to do this. One of the easiest ways that we have is we'll use computers. Now, they do a much better job than humans because we don't have, they don't have emotions involved in it. They're not necessarily looking for the same things that we are, but computers themselves follow programs. A program by definition is not random. It's what you expect to happen. It's you're giving instructions on what to do for each case. So when we talk about a computer generated random numbers, it's actually something that is pseudo random. It's close enough for us though. If you look at it over the long period of time, yes, they might all start in the same location. They might be very similar. When you keep going through and through and through and starting it again, starting it again, 
typically you're not going to see much overlap. It gets the job done without being perfect, and that's okay. That's what we call practical randomness. Now this is just a cute little clip. If you ask a person to generate random numbers, yeah, they can sit there and just give you numbers, the same number over and over and over. And that can happen randomly. I'm not sure if you've ever heard the saying, but if you put a thousand monkeys in a room, eventually they're gonna produce the complete works of Shakespeare. It is possible, anything is possible. And just because something came out that made sense doesn't mean it wasn't 100% random. We have to figure out ways to understand when things actually are. We need to have an imitation of something that is real so that you can manipulate and control it. What that means is that gives you a chance to take something that is pseudo random or close enough to being random to be able to apply it in a way to save ourselves a lot of time and effort. You don't wanna constantly be flipping a, a coin. You don't wanna constantly be rolling a dice. You wanna be able to have something that allow you to get the results that you want with slight control. You want to be able to simulate reality. That's what randomness allows us to do. If we have something that is truly random, we can simulate what's going to happen in real life. Now, what is a simulation? She said simulate. What the heck does that mean? That's one of our words that we're starting with here. And if you were looking at your flip books, this is a great opportunity for you to fill out one of those numerous definitions that you have for that. A simulation is broken down into many different pieces. The first thing that we look at is the sequence of events themselves. What are we trying to determine? What are we trying to examine? That is our trial. A trial is one complete sequence of events. So for example, a trial might be rolling a die three times and finding what the sum of those numbers are. So you would, each thing you would roll a dice, the sequence of events would be to roll one die, record it, roll it, record it, roll it, record it, find the sum and that's your sequence of events. That's your first trial. Each of those dice themselves is a component. They're the things that make up your, sim your simulation. Now your simulation itself probably involves several components. It's usually not just doing one thing once. For example, I said rolling a dice three times, recording the number that's on the face and then finding the sum. So the component would be rolling the dice you do that three times and you record the sum. So each component is repeated. After the trial, so after we've done that action of recording, of rolling the dice three times, we record your results, you record your response variable. My response variable is actually what I'm interested in measuring. So for the example I've been giving you, the response variable would be the sum of the digits on the dice. Now, when you want to do a simulation, there are seven steps for a successful simulation. You really, really have to understand these seven steps clearly from start to finish. And you have to fulfill every single one of them. They have to be clearly stated. Remember, clear, complete, concise, and in context. Following these seven steps will allow your simulation to meet all of those requirements. So what are the seven steps? The first step is to identify the component to be repeated. What are you going to be doing? Now, this isn't the entire trial. For the example that I gave you of rolling a dice three times and figuring out what the sum of those would be, the component that you're going to be repeating is rolling the dice. You actually have to spell this out. So if they ask you to build a simulation, your first step is to identify the component to be repeated. What are you going to be doing? Then you model or you explain how you're going to model the outcome. For example, I'm not actually going to sit here and roll a dice three times because what happens if I drop the dice, if it falls off the desk, if it falls on the floor, it just takes too much time, you go a little crazy, yada, yada, yada. So we're not actually going to do that, we're going to model it, but we have to be very careful with how we model it because the model has to match what the possible outcomes are. I'm not gonna say I'm going to roll a dice where the only numbers that are possible are one through six and I'm gonna be using the digits zero through nine and all of them are gonna be used. What does a nine mean? That doesn't show up. You have to define what it means in order to match 
the outcomes that you have possible. Then you want to explain how those components combine to make a trial. For example, rolling the dice three times. What does the trial consist of? Well, I, I record the results from the three components and then the trial is completed when I have the sum of those three. What that final thing is, that is your response variable. What I'm recording is the sum of three rolls of the die. You have to specify this. Then you actually do it. You run several trials. Now, that could mean that you roll a dice three times, record the sum, roll a dice three times, record the sum, roll a dice three times, record the sum. Or you could be using something to simulate this. That's okay. Whichever one you're going to do, we now do it many, many times. And you have to record your outcomes for every single trial. Every single component, every single trial has to be summarized and shown. And that's actually what step six is. Collect and summarize the results. So you're going to say, what were the results? I rolled a one, I rolled a three, I rolled another one. The outcome for that, the final response variable was five. That was my total sum. Then I do it again. I rolled a six, I rolled a three, I rolled a five. Write down the sum. You do that again. You're recording all of the data. And when it says summarize, you want to find the appropriate statistical measurement. Am I looking for a mode? What occurs the most often? Am I looking for an average? Or am I looking for a range? You can be looking for all sorts of different things. You could actually be interested in the standard deviation. You have to summarize your results in a way that it covers everything that you're inter interested in learning about. And the final step, don't forget this guy, state your conclusion. What did you learn from it? Okay, based on my results, I expect from rolling a die that the most common sum is going to be uh, 24, if that's what your results say. And you have to state why that occurred, why you, why you feel that way, what is your supporting evidence, okay? So identify the component to be repeated. You're gonna actually wanna de define this. So this might just be roll a dice. Explain how you'll model the component's outcome. For this guy, you want probability in real life to equal the probability in the model. You have to occur at the same amount of likelihood. And then you're going to explain how you will combine the components to model the trial. So that means you're going to start doing what, you're going to record what, and you're going to go until what. And that go until is very, very important. You always want to include, where am I going to go to? When do I need to stop? When you are stating your response variable, that's basically saying, what are you going to record? Okay, you're saying what that record is actually talking about. Run several top trials. Basically, five and six are about do it and record results. So you'll see a lot of these are the same things over and over again. Collect and summarize the results. That's your statistics. And then our favorite word, state your conclusion. This is got to be in context. Okay, must have context. Stating your conclusion puts everything back in context. What can go wrong? Sometimes in stats, there are so many different things that we're doing that it's sometimes easier to talk about what not to do rather than what to do. The first thing is really be very careful. Don't overstate your case. You cannot tell me what is going to happen when I roll a dice. You are not psychic. You cannot tell me exactly what's going to happen. So instead, you want to make sure that we're emphasizing here what might happen not what really is going to happen. Anything can happen. We're saying this is what I think will happen. One of the hardest things to do is to model your outcome chances accurately. And what that means is you want to make sure that whatever you're using to model your events, that again, your probabilities match. Probability in the model has to match the probability that's possible through the simulation. 
And then you've got to run enough trials. Simulation is one of the coolest things because you don't actually have to do that in real life. You can simulate it, it's cheap, it's, sometimes it's even free. You can just do it over and over again. Now, typically when we talk about running enough trials, we're going to want, for the sake of kind of later information, we're gonna want our n to be greater than 20 at least. We wanna do something at least 20 times so that we can see a nice display of what's possible. Now, that's not a set number. You can do whatever you're required to do, but 20 is a good starting point. Now, when we're actually wanting to use a random number generator, you want to be comfortable with your calculator because that's really where we're going to be with this. Now, your TI calculator has a random number generator on it. And what's really cool, and we'll show you this together in class, is that if we reset our calculators and we start our random number generator with this, and if everybody uses the same instructions, they will all start with the exact same numbers. So is that really random? No, but if you run it enough, you change your instructions, your starts, what, how many numbers you want it to generate, you'll notice that they'll start differing from one for enough, from, to another. That's good. The random number generator is a starting place. It's a heck of a lot better than you would do on your own. So understand it's not perfect. This is all pseudo random. So what we've got here is we have just a really good example of something that we want to simulate. Suppose I have a basketball player with an 80% free throw success rate. That right there, my friends, is very, very important. An 80% free throw success rate. That's what we believe that this person is at. How can we use a random number generator or random number table to simulate whether or not she makes a foul shot? What should we expect to happen? How many shots should you expect her to be able to make in a row without missing one? So how long can she go until she makes a miss? So what we want to do is we want to describe the waiting time for how long it takes for her to throw these balls until she misses a shot. And we want to count the number of successes she gets prior to that first miss. Does that mean I'm going to tell her that, hey, I know this person is going to make six shots every single time before they throw before they miss their first free throw no it's saying this is what we expect to happen this is what we would expect to see happening over the extreme long run so we're going to go through each one of these state steps for this problem okay identify the component explain the model explain the simulation how are you going to do the trials identify your response variable run the trials analyze it and state your conclusion okay so here we go Identify the component. The component is that thing that we are trying to simulate. What are we trying to mimic? And in this case, we're taking a shot. So that's what we would actually write. We would say a component is taking one shot, or if you want to be even more specific, that is taking one free throw. Okay. Now what we need to do is we need to figure out a way to model this situation. Remember, from the previous screen, we said that she had an 80% success rate for our throws. And so what we want to do is we want to figure out a way using random numbers so that I can mimic that 80% success rate, so that 80% of my outcomes will be a shot that's made, and the resulting the leftover 20% would be a shot that's not made. One of the things that we do is by using a random number generator, you know you have the digits from zero through nine. So zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. Now that's 10 digits. Each of them are single digit numbers. And we typically focus on single digit numbers. And in order to mimic that 80% success rate, we need 80% of these numbers to be a good shot. And you can do that in two different ways. You can actually, there are many different ways, but you can set zero through seven. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight out of the 10 options is a good shot. Or if you'd like, you can also rephrase that and use one through eight as a good shot and say nine and zero are a miss. You just have to define which one that you're going to use. So we're going to use one, zero through seven to be a good shot and eight and nine are going to be a miss. And you have to be very clear 
defining those. You want to make sure this is 80%. So 80% is a successful shot and we have 20% would be a failure. Now we're going to say, what am I going to do? Explain the simulation. What does each trial look like? Well, in this case, my simulation is going to look each number represents a shot that we're going to investigate. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at each random number that's generated one digit at a time. And it's very important that we look at that. And they should really say that here, one digit at a time. And we're going to just look at all of them until we get that eight or nine. Remember that eight or nine, those were my 20% failures. What am I going to do? Well, I'm going to count the number of shots it takes me. I'm not going to count two plus four plus one plus six. I'm not going to add those guys up. I'm just going to simply count them. Each number that is not an eight or a nine is just a good shot. And I'm going to count the number of good shots until I hit an eight or a nine. When I hit an eight or a nine, I'm not going to count that. I'm going to count the numbers that came before. Okay, now I'm going to run trials. Now, remember what we said. We said we were going to use zero through seven to be good. And we said eight and nine are going to be a miss. Now, what I have here in front of you, this is a section of a random number table. Your, your textbook has one of these in the back. We'll be using it frequently. These are nice and they're broken down this way so we can kind of keep track of where we are. They're broken down into groups of five digits at a time. We typically start on one end, we work left to right. You can either, you can stop anywhere you want and then pick up again on the next level, or you can just keep going. So what we're gonna do is we're going to start with this number and we are going to record the number of good shots we have until we've hit a miss. So again, zero through seven is good. So good, 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 and there's my miss. So that is the end of my first trial. Okay, so that means for trial one, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine shots were made before I missed a shot. Now I'm going to pick up on trial two. You can either start on the next line, but because I don't have too many numbers to deal with here, I am going to actually go through and just continue counting where I left off. So now I'm going to say this is a good shot, good shot, good, 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 good. I'm doing a much better job this time around. Look at all these. Good, 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 good. And here's my miss. So that is the end of my second trial. So my second trial has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. 15 shots on my second trial. And we'll just do one more trial here just so you get an idea of what's going on. If I'm looking at my third trial, I'm going to say good, good, and miss. So that third trial stops right after the nine. So for the third trial, I only had two shots before I missed. Now you can see here that it's not saying 80%. I'm going to make eight shots and then miss two. They're just saying 80% of the numbers that I see should be representing good ones. Now we're going to analyze the response variable. This can mean very different things. If I am looking for the average or what you should expect, okay, my expected value, that's going to be the mean number of shots that you made. So in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to say, what is the average of all of those? So we would say X bar or my average of my sample 9 plus 15 plus 2 divided by 3. We would take that result, allow us, oops, sorry, to state our conclusion. And so my conclusion for that one would have been, well, based on three trials, I would expect on average, oh goodness, 9 plus 15 is 24 plus 2 is 26 divided by 3 is just shy of 8, which about sounds average. Now, what if I were to change this? What if instead I wanted my simulation 
to only have 72% chance. This makes things a little bit more difficult. Our rules still stay the, stay the same. We're still going to identify the component. The component is still one shot. Okay, that's not going to change. What's gonna change here is the model. Okay, how am I going to show this occurring? And the simulation is still going to be the same. All of this is gonna be the same, except for that explain the model. And the model changes, because now we need 72% to be good. And that means that we need the other 28% to be misses. Now, letting the digits 0 through 7 no longer represents the percent that I want, so we need to change this. So, how so sticking with this idea here, what we have is our new scenario says that we believe that 72% of my shots should be good, which means that the remaining 28% should be misses. Before, what we were looking at is we were looking at the single digit numbers. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Oh, 10 is not a single digit number. So there are 10 single digits, 0 through 9. The problem is, is I can't just use those because wherever I stop, if I stop here, that's 80%. If I'm looking at that side, that's 80%. If I stop one further over, that's going to be 70%. So that's not what I want. So what do we need to do? Well, hopefully you're thinking to yourself, well, gee, Miss Augsburger, if one digit doesn't work, let's try two. So that's what we're going to do is we're going to look at pairs of digits. And that's very important that you look at that pairs of digits. You could say the word double digit or the words double digit. Or you can look at pairs of digits or two digits at a time. But that means that we're starting from double zero and going to 99. Some people will think about that as zero one. 0, 2, 0, 3, all the way up to 99, and they think of double zeros kind of standing for 100. I don't care where you put that double zero. Just make sure that when you define this, hopefully you see there's actually a mistake on the next line, that your percents match up with everything that's possible. The mistake here says 0, 1 through 71 is a good shot. That's a mistake because that says 71%. And 72 to 99 percent, well, that says 28 percent. That does not add up to 100. So we need to change something so that it adds up to 100 and reflects the percents that I want. So what I need to do is I need to change that to a zero. Now that represents 72 percent of the total outcomes. That represents 28. We are good to go. Now when we explain the simulation, again, you're going to say start helps if I write start correctly. What are you going to look at? And when do you stop? Those are the things that you're trying to do. So where do I, where do I start here? I'm going to do shot at shot. You're going to look at a series of random digits. This really should say two at a time. And you're going to record how long it takes me to get the number 72 or, gate, or greater. And you would actually want to say that that's what you're going to record. And then you would go along and complete the rest of it. So the only thing that really changed here was what your model was. You're still going to go until you have your first miss. In this case, the miss represents the numbers from 72 to 99. You're going to record that number. And then we, we run through with the rest of it. Now when we get to class, we're going to have some nice practice over this, but I hope that when you come in, you have all of the terms and definitions written down. You have a general idea of what are the seven steps to a simulation, so that in class we can really work on how do we get the calculators to work for us, how do we get the tables to work for us, and what do I actually expect to be shown.